Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we gather together in the name of your Son, we pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to you, to your presence, to your word, for that which you want to work both in us and flow through us. And so we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. When I looked at the music that Josh had picked for the service, I kept thinking, what does this have to do with the readings? I, I have this thing about it. I really believe that somehow, if we're paying attention, that word, music, and liturgy speak together. They're like a chorus. They don't necessarily speak with the same voice, but they're definitely not supposed to be an off-key choir, one of those pickup groups that you get to sing at the very end, and then you wish you hadn't asked one of the singers, who's bigger and louder and more off-key than everybody else. But what I didn't know at the time was that Josh was the one listening to the Lord, and not me. Because as I began to read the lessons, there was one verse that just, have you ever had this happen? Where it just leaps off the page. I was looking today, actually, I need a new flashlight. And I was looking at ads for a flashlight. And they had one that actually you can turn on and it either goes broad like this, or it's like a pin dot. And it's a concentration. And the pin dot for me in reading the lessons was Jesus's line out of the Gospel of John. I have food to eat that you do not know anything about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. And what I kept thinking was, how is that possible? How is it possible that somehow Jesus, God incarnate in human flesh, has the kind of flow that happens through him, my words, not his, that somehow energize him and feed him physically, emotionally, spiritually in a way that causes him to not really care whether he gets lunch or not. Now I say that as a deeply committed foodie. Um, where I eat and what I eat really matters. And I really like to geek out and get into these very esoteric conversations about how spices work or the best way to do barbecue. We could talk for hours about barbecue. And all the other things that make up people who, for whom, what happens in the mouth and the taste buds really, really matters. But it was actually more personal than that. Because as some of you know, uh, Sunday afternoon at St. Simon of Cyrene in the reception, I collapsed. And they had to get me to the hospital. And as it turned out, everything checked out just fine. But I snuck out in the middle of the day to go see my primary just to make sure everything is in working order, which it is, thanks be to God. But more than anything, quite honestly, what it turns out that it could well be is just overwork. Now, overwork is precisely the opposite of my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Are you there? So there is a reason that a while ago, as I'm looking through the lessons, that's where the pin dot happened. Because little did I know, but that the Holy Spirit was actually speaking to me about something that he wanted to use to get to my attention. Little did I know it would cause me to fall over at a reception to the consternation of everybody else in the room. Do you know how bizarre it feels <laughs> that you just check out? I mean, I mean, my head went down. And then 15 seconds later, I look up and everybody's <laughs> just like that. So I found a prayer that takes me on this journey. And it's a prayer, no surprise, from Henri Nouwen. And this is what he prays. Dear God, I am so afraid to open my clenched fist. Who will I be when I have nothing left to hold on to? 
Who will I be when I stand before you with completely empty hands, able to show you nothing? Please help me to gradually open my hands and to discover that I am not what I own, but what you want to give me, only what you want to give me. Back to the lesson. The disciples are clueless about the import of Jesus' words. They actually echo the question of the woman at the well, who by this time is going into the village to tell everybody what Jesus had done. Because she says, where are we going to find a drink? And it's the disciples who come and say, but where are we going to have food? And it is in the answer to that question that Jesus says, my food is to do the, do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. It foreshadows a promise that he will say, just two chapters later, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me shall never be hungry. The one who comes to me shall never be thirsty. Now, have you ever had this, I'm sure you have, where you've read something so many times it just goes straight over your head because you actually think you know what it means, but the bottom line is you know about this much of a verse that's that deep? Uh, the, it got pulled away a little bit of that um, arrogant, self-centered assumption, not too strong a word, as it relates to how I thought about this verse. Because you see, I couldn't square it with the fact that my problem is that I'm often spiritually hungry and spiritually thirsty. But as I began to ponder this in the light of what was happening, I realized that I'm often hungry and thirsty because I want things from Jesus that actually he's not ready to give me. I want access to the vending machine of ask and you shall receive. <laughs> when more often than not, there is a deeper lesson. The formation of my abject <coughs> dependency that he is working in me, that actually makes instantaneous answers to prayer at cross purposes with his desire to conform me to the image of his son. Did you hear that? You see, if I can just go and press the button, quote the Bible verse, and it happens, what that does in a way is solidify the mechanism whereby I can get something from God. In other words, it's actually an expression of personal mastery, not subjective servanthood. But if I don't really know how to pray, even when I offer it the best I've got, and that I am in fact utterly dependent upon God to choose or not in his timing to say yes or just flat out, no, I'm not going to do that. That keeps me in a position of learning how to seek his face, hear his voice, follow where he leads. You see, it's not that God is stingy. Far from it. I mean, I, I've seen extraordinary miracles, including the blind see, the deaf hear, and the lame walk. I mean, this is not some sort of Calvinistic expression of secessionism at all. I'm a full-blown charismatic. But I want you to know that there is something about the task, the invitation, the opportunity of asking and receiving that never makes it entirely automatic because God wants to unite us to himself more than he wants to just give us whatever it is that we want. He will never be reduced, meaning God. God will never be reduced to a mechanism that gets what we need, ever. So what am I failing to do? <laughs> I'm, I'm, fi I'm failing to learn the lesson found in the book of Deuteronomy, which echoes, sort of precedes, as it were, antecedent to Jesus' words. When it says, God caused you to hunger, 
and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, it is the relationship and the conforming nature of that relationship that is primary, always primary. And it runs at direct cross purposes. It comes after it actually with a weapon. My desire to say, I want what I want when I want it, so I need to know how to get it so I can master prayer so that I can get what I need. So what happens is, is that in those moments, my fist is clenched trying to grasp what really is just the thin air of my own demanding desires. As Archbishop William Temple succinctly wrote, many ask for something from Christ. What he offers is himself. How do I know I am grasping at that which is other than Jesus himself? For me, at least, the symptoms are pretty evident. First of all, and I hope this doesn't sound too sort of Robert Bly, but there is a certain wildness that gets quickly domesticated. I am counting on the predictable just to get through the demands of life because frankly, the unpredictable is exasperating. I can't master it. It gets in the way and actually winds up being completely exhausting. Number two, I am, not, I am tempted not to nurture people, but to use them to get what I need done. And it is one who has been in mystery, ministry for a while who has the seasoned capability of actually using someone with the most extraordinarily biblical language. It is like the tempter quoting scripture to Jesus in the wilderness. I'm a fan of the English poet W.H. Auden. And in his he was wrestling with what was happening in, in England during the rise of Nazism before World War II. And he was stunned by how the violence and horror of war showed the true nature of human beings in a way that most humanists found genuinely shocking. And in his poem, The Cave of Making, he writes, more than ever, life out there used to feel goodly, miraculous, lovable, but we shan't, not since Stalin and Hitler, trust ourselves ever again. We know that subjectively in us all is possible. In September 1939, he dismissed the fantasy that anyone's private life could be innocent of the evils that so obviously drove public life, even in England individual persons known subjectively as if looking at a mirror that they could in fact treat others as objects to be used just as nations do. He wrote, out of the mirror they stare, imperialism's face, and international wrongs in me. He observed to friends how common it was to find dedicated patriots who conducted their personal life as if they were invading Poland. It created a kind of cynicism and yet at the same time Christian hope. That's the temptation when you're just grasping. Nature, instead of being refreshing, the heavens declaring the glory of God, actually begins to feel boring. My phone addiction becomes more and more important as I try with my phone, and isn't this true for many of us, to fill in the gaps of what I am not getting in my day-to-day -day reality. I'm no longer free to be spontaneous because the next demand is breathing down my neck. Patience with others only becomes a tool to get what I want. The focus of my curiosity is limited by merely wanting to learn more about what I need to acquire for the next thing, including preachers studying just to get your sermons done, right? Unbounded curiosity in the face of the unknown is for people in retirement who have the time. God, however, is merciful. I don't have to get to the point of having the food come out of my nostrils because I keep demanding the meat that I want. 
but it can be a long way back. My life can feel abject if I really go there. <laughs> I need to be rescued. It is the desperation expressed in the opening line of morning prayer. Have you ever noticed, Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Lord, open my lips, because left to my own devices, I need God to open my lips, to break the deafening silence of the noise in my head with his grace and cause me to praise. I have to walk back. Actually, what I really need is for Jesus to just stop me in my tracks, take me by the shoulders, and turn me around and show me where he is way behind me because I'm running so fast. To keep saying yes to Jesus, see, I told you so, <laughs> offers instead of my striving to keep up the invitation to go back, to walk at his pace. Because it's only then that I have the breathing room to crack a joke and not be cynical, to be genuinely curious, to actually take interest in people who can do nothing for me, and learn to live and breathe and actually begin to notice which bird is in the tree rather than being irritated by the noise. A wag once said that every, one, every time one goes to the refrigerator, the bottle, or the internet, one is actually looking for God. That can be true for me. But I really do need to get God to take me because I don't want to let go that easily. Because even though I believe in the depths of my heart, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, there is still a part of me that wants in the sight of God and everybody else to prove my worth. Even though, if I really get honest, it's the thin air in my hand that takes me nowhere. So what is the invitation out of all of this? It is to be willing to admit that the, which I clench so profoundly is, in fact, a delusion. And to hold on to it is to invite only greater delusion. Because one lie, even if one believes it inside and tells it to no one, always begets more lies. We're never free except we are made free. And the invitation becomes again, eat my flesh, drink my blood, sit, be still, learn what it is again to walk as a child. Not just, yeah, yeah, I know that. But at least in my life, there is this cycle of learning how to rest, and then enjoying the pace and the energy of resting and walking and resting and running and then running and then not resting and then running some more because I'm getting tired and I don't want to get stopped along the way. <laughs> Until God says, okay, now's the time. Brothers and sisters, colleagues, family of God, Come to me, Jesus says, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Let us learn again to receive the food that only he can give us so that we can walk with him. And then when invited, run the race that is set before us. Amen.